Welcome to today's review lecture, 24th of, 21st of February 2018, recorded on this snow day as preparation for the exam, which will be happening, assuming that school is open, on Friday the 23rd at 9 a.m. Check www.pdx.edu to make sure that the school will be open. Also check D2L if you have any questions about the material in this review and or have any questions. If your questions are not answered and what you can find in D2L, please send me an email at kstedman at pdx.edu. So again, this will be a review, no new slides, no new material since the previous lectures. I wanted to go over a couple of things in a little bit more detail. And again, if you have questions, please check D2L or send me an email. We started out just very briefly after the last midterm talking about the eukaryotic replication fork and some of the differences that are present in eukaryotic replication relative to bacterial replication. There are really two main things that are different. The first one is the presence of excuse me, this Paul alpha polymerase here. Paul alpha is a DNA polymerase, which extends the RNA primer, which is made by the DNA primase. This again is only present in eukaryotic cells. The other protein which is only present in eukaryotic cells is this FEN1, the flap endonuclease, which cuts off the primer <coughs> which was made by the DNA primase. Also wanted to remind you that there's always a toporisomerase, and this could be a toporisomerase type 1 or type 2, that has to precede the replication fork in such a way that not too many supercoils are formed. Toporisomerases are needed both in bacterial and in eukaryotic systems. The eukaryotic replication origin, we talked about bacterial replication origins the last time. Quick review on these eukaryotic replication origins. There are many eukaryotic replication origins as opposed to the single one which you find in most bacteria. These multiple origins of replication are bound by the origin recognition complex or ORC. <clears throat> in its unphosphorylated state, phosphates are removed during the cell cycle, then the origin recognition complex can interact with CDC6 and CDT1. Once these guys have interacted with each other, then the replicative helicase, the MCM protein, together with the GINS protein, will associate with this pre-replicative complex. You can also think of this a little bit like the pre-initiation complex that you see at eukaryotic promoters, where you're going to be getting transcription. So this is what's present at the end of the GAP1 phase. As there's the transition from the GAP1 phase to the S phase, cyclin-dependent kinases will phosphorylate CDC6 and the origin recognition complex in such a way that the MCM helicase is activated. Once the MCM helicase is activated, the two strands are pulled apart, and now we can have DNA primase, all the rest of the replication complexes, which will form on these denatured DNAs. And now we have a phosphorylated ORC complex. This phosphorylated ORC complex is no longer competent to bind to CDC6 and CDT1, which is what you would need in order to get replication to take place. So this whole cycle will go through again after the end of G2 phase, M phase, now beginning of G1, assemble the process, and it will go through one more time. The ends <clears throat> of linear genomes, like we have, and almost all eukaryotes have, have an interesting problem, and that is that they're always going to have a three prime overhang at the end. And the reason for that is that there was, on the opposite strand here, a primer which has been put down, which is an RNA primer by DNA primase. That RNA primer has been removed either by RNase H or the flap endonuclease. Now, at the very end of each of these chromosomes, also known as the 
telomere, will have this particular sequence. To this 3' prime overhang, the telomerase can bind through base pairing interactions with the RNA template which is present in the telomerase enzyme. This now will provide a template for the reverse transcriptase to extend at the 3' prime end of your linear chromosome. In this process, making multiple repeat structures. In this case, the repeat structure is T G, 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 T, T, which is complementary to the RNA, which is present in telomerase. After this 3' prime end has been greatly extended, now you have a template whereby the DNA primase can bind, make a primer, and DNA polymerase can continue that. Nonetheless, even with these telomeres, which can be hundreds of copies long, you will always have a short end here with that repeated sequence, which is a single-stranded 3' prime end. That now can loop around because it's a repeated sequence, base pair further down in the telomere, making this T loop, which helps to protect the end of your chromosomes. That's all we had in terms of replication. Then we turned to DNA repair mechanisms. A few things that I wanted to mention here, which I didn't the first time through, but I think are quite important, is thinking about what some of these proteins are named for. For instance, here, the xeroderma pigmatosum proteins, the XP proteins. Xeroderma pigmatosum is a very high sensitivity to UV irradiation. That UV irradiation sensitivity is because these proteins are involved in nucleotide excision repair, which is what is used in humans to repair pyrimidine dimers, which form due to UV irradiation. XP variants um, turns out to be not this nucleoside excision repair, but a translesion polymerase. BRCA1, many of you have probably heard about this, mutated in many breast and ovarian cancers, is important for homologous recombination. So you can see that many of these proteins are important for the mechanisms of DNA repair, which we'll talk about and review in the next couple of slides. What are the most common kinds of DNA damage? Well, the most common kinds of DNA damage happen because we like to live in a relatively warm, full of oxygen and aqueous environment. So the vast majority of DNA damage, in this case, chemical changes that happen to the DNA, happen through hydrolysis, which is shown by, again, the blue arrows here, less so oxidative damage, and even less so methylation. The main things with hydrolysis here are really the depurination, so the hydrolysis of the glycosidic bond right here between the one prime position in the deoxyribose and the base. Same thing is true for adenine, again the other purine, and then deamination of cytosines, whereby, whereby this amino group is lost. But lots of other places where you can have both hydrolysis, oxidative damage, or methylation in these various bases. Once you have this kind of change, this needs to be repaired. <clears throat> We've talked about basically the three main mechanisms, mismatch repair, nucleotide excision repair, and base excision repair, and then double-stranded break repair, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Mismatch repair, <clears throat> per se, is often included in discussions of replication because in many cases this occurs because the incorrect base has been added to the DNA. And when I say incorrect here, it's one of the four normal bases, but it just doesn't base pair properly with the template strand base. So what happens in that case? You will have a mismatch. And here shown with a TG mismatch, this is still a purine paired with a pyrimidine, but the base pair interactions are unclear. Because of that, the DNA is going to have an incorrect structure here. Because of this incorrect structure, this can be recognized by a protein which recognizes mismatches or incorrect structures in DNA. That protein 
in bacteria is the mute S protein. Mute S protein together with mute L will bind to this mismatch, but then it needs to figure out which of the strands is the old strand, i.e. where you've put in the wrong nucleotide that needs to be taken out, or the old strand, which has the proper base on it. That's solved in bacteria by the presence of mute H, which binds to hemimethylated, so methyl group on one strand and not on the other strand, DNA, and will make a nick. Nick here is just cutting the phosphodiester backbone so that the new strand will always have a few nicks in it. This nick then allows the rest of the Mascher machinery to cut out. When I say cut out here, it's really a helicase activity that removes this piece of DNA between. Now this will be repaired using the original template strand, which now has the correct nucleotide on it, and hopefully, and is true the vast majority of the time, again, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 2, so <clears throat> 1 in 10 billion is incorrect, but in this case, highly likely to be the correct, and then the whole process moves forward. Big question here is how do eukaryotes know which strand is the new strand and which strand is the old strand. This mostly seems to be because the lagging strand in particular has many nicks in it because it's being made in a semi-discontinuous fashion. So that's the way it's getting repaired. And probably the leading strand has a number of nicks in it as well. That's also um, something which we haven't talked about but does seem to be the case. So we talked about mismatch repair. The other two main forms of dealing with DNA damage that is only present on one strand, are either base excision repair or nucleotide excision repair. Base excision repair is a very specific mechanism that will recognize single modified bases, remove them from the DNA, or in the case of depurination, it, that base has already been removed, and repair them by cutting out one and only one nucleotide. Again, this can only happen if you have a very specific kind of change because you either need a DNA glycosylase to cut out this single nucleotide, in this case uracil, or recognize that you have an AP, AP being just missing any base, and that gets removed as a single nucleotide. If, on the other hand, you have larger changes that happens, for instance, a pyrimidine dimer which is formed, usually, again, due to UV irradiation, then, in a manner much more similar to what we see with base mismatch repair, there are nucleases which will cut on either side of this DNA damage. DNA helicase will remove the piece of DNA that includes this DNA damage and this will be replaced. The big advantage to this system, as opposed to the base excision repair system, is that this recognizes many, many, many different kinds of DNA damage. This one is only going to recognize very specific DNA damage. So general system, less efficient, specific system, more efficient, but depends on having these exact enzymes that are required for making those changes. The other kind of DNA damage which we spent some time talking about is double-stranded break repair. Double-stranded break repair, there are two mechanisms which we discussed in terms of repairing double-stranded breaks. One of those is the quick and dirty method, the non-homologous end joining, whereby double-stranded breaks happen, nucleotides are degraded, and the ends are put back together. In this case, you always have a deletion of the DNA sequence. On the other hand, if you have homologous recombination, double-stranded break, loss of nucleotides at the ends, just like you have in non-homologous end joining, but now the information from a homologous DNA is used to repair. And if anything, this figure would be better if it had the orange sequence here rather than the red sequence. Um, Usually, if you're talking about sister chromatids, or in the case of bacterial replication, you will have a very similar, if not absolutely identical, sequence here. 
But if it's just a similar sequence, particularly as we'll see in myonic recombination in just a second here, you can have actual transfer of information from one chromosome to another. So let's look at meiotic recombination in a little bit more detail. We can ignore this side for now. We have homologous chromosomes, which have paired in meiosis. Then you have a double-stranded break, which forms. But instead of a random double-stranded break, this is now a double-stranded break, which is made by endonucleases, pretty nonspecific endonucleases, that are induced in meiosis after you've had this double-stranded break form due to these endonucleases, the ends will be chewed back, just like you have in normal double-stranded break repair, leaving three prime overhangs, rec A type proteins, RAD51, in most eukaryotic cells or similar, RAD51 is a yeast cell protein, binds to the single strand, you have strand invasion that takes place, displacement of one strand. This strand now has A3'OH, a template. You can have extension of this. All of the green shown here is after that extension has already taken place. After you have this DNA synthesis, these ends will get ligated together, generating to holiday junctions. So this is exactly the same thing that we looked at on the last slide. After ligation, you have here again, this ligase has happened here. This end is ligated to that end. <clears throat> now we have two holiday junctions where we have the DNA, which is sharing different strands. These holiday junctions clearly are a problem because we've got the two DNA molecules, those two double-stranded DNA molecules, which are now crossed over. So somehow these need to be separated from each other. These can be separated in two different ways, you know, here shown as horizontally and vertically. It's actually better to look at in this slide, where basically what we've done, we've taken one of those holiday junctions and really zoomed into it here. And if you think about what a holiday junction really looks like, as we have down here, in the lower right hand side of the slide is that a holiday junction is really symmetrical looks like this rather than one strand is continuous and the other two strands are crossing over with each other and so here it should be hopefully quite obvious that you could cut either vertically or horizontally and these are basically exactly the same thing in terms of binding them back to each other one thing that I think I did a poor job of explaining in the first round of lectures is the process called branch migration. So what is branch migration? Branch migration is when you have these holiday junction structures, what can happen is that this branch can move in this direction or in that direction based on the presence of proteins like these here, the Rov proteins, whereby this branch can move back and forth. And it can literally move back and forth hundreds of nucleotides. And in that process, what you end up with is you'll end up with quite a long stretch of DNA, which is a heteroduplex. When we say heteroduplex, what that means is you'll have some genetic information from one of the chromosomes and other genetic information from the other chromosome. And the more branch migration that you get, the more of this heteroduplex you will have, and the more likely it will be that you can have gene conversion take place because the mismatch repair machinery will recognize this mismatched sequence and say, hmm, we need to get rid of one of these. And in that process can lose genetic information from one of their parental chromosomes and gain it from the other. So that's all DNA repair. Then we talked a little bit about transposons, really three main classes of transposons, the so-called DNA-only transposons, which are quite present in bacteria, but also you find them in plants and in fruit flies the retroviral-like retrotransposons, which you also find in fruit flies, 
but also quite a lot in humans. And then the most common of the transposons that you find in the human genome are these non-retroviral retrotransposons, which you see in these genomes. So let's take a look at each of these, particularly the cut and paste or DNA only transposons. Again, very common in bacteria, but also found in humans and other eukaryotes. Here have a transposon with a short inverted repeat sequence at either end of the transposon. This binds to the transposase protein. That transposase protein is encoded for on this DNA in the middle of the transposon. You have this <clears throat> transposase, which will cut out the transposon from the place in the chromosome where it was. This transpososome, I like to call it the transposon itself with the transposase, will go to some other place in the genome, cut in an offset form, so these two cuts on the either strand are not completely opposite each other, and would leave a little gap here, like this little black piece here and this little black piece there, once you put in the new transposon. This black sequence here will be replicated by the cellular polymerases, generating a direct repeat on either side of your integrated transposon. Very similar things happen with retroviral retrotransposons. You also end up with these short direct repeats at either end of the retroviral-like retrotransposons. But here, instead of having inverted repeats at the presence of the transposons, you actually have a direct repeat at either end. And again, if you're interested in why that happens, take my virology course next term. Did want to briefly mention the most common of the retro elements found in the human genome. These are the line and sign elements. The, the line element here, L1, is one of those line elements that you find in the human chromosome has a large open reading frame and a stretch of ATs at the end. That open reading frame encodes reverse transcriptase endonuclease protein. This now can bind to the RNA, which is made by cellular polymerases, cellular RNA polymerases, and then take this RNA and insert it into the host genome somewhere else in the genome. And by the binding of this reverse transcriptase endonuclease to the end of the L1 RNA, this now has reverse transcriptase activity, will make a copy of this line element, and that will get inserted into the DNA, providing it with this poly A tail at the end. A number of people have asked me during office hours and also via email, the difference between the line elements, like this one, and the sign elements. The big difference is that the sign elements are lacking the open reading frame, which encodes for the reverse transcriptase endonuclease, but they still have the sequence, including this poly A tail at the end of the RNA, which this reverse transcriptase endonuclease, which is going to be encoded by a line element that can now use on a sign elements. These sign elements are the shorter interspersed nuclear elements which can now insert into the genome. Basically think of them as parasites on these large interspersed nuclear elements. We briefly talked about site-specific recombination. Again, very important for viruses, but also has been used by cells to avoid the immune system. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about replication, so excuse me, transcriptional regulation after the exam. But also is used in the case of specific gene deletion or recombineering in order to remove specific genes from the DNA. And so this is the process of excision. If you have two directly repeated sequences in your DNA, you put in a specific recombinase. What will happen is the piece of DNA between these two direct repeats will be excised or removed from the DNA, and you end up with a gene deletion. In the case of some viruses, particularly the lambda bacteriophage, 
goes in the opposite direction. It's a circular DNA that has a DNA sequence in it which is repeated in the host chromosome, and then you can have integration of this process. If these repeated sequences are now in an inverted relationship, so inverted repeats relative to each other, the presence of one of these site-specific recombinases will just invert the two pieces. So here we have gene A and gene B going from left to right. Here we have gene B and gene A. Each time you have recombination, you will flip these back and forth. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about RNA, particularly transcription, and then right at the end, a little bit about translation. Few important things about transcription. One of those is that transcription amplifies a copy of a particular part of your genome. So when we talk about replication, you go from one copy to two copies to four copies. You can go from one copy and in transcription make many copies of that. And then of course in translation make even many copies of any one of those particular RNAs. You can also have much smaller amounts of transcription that happen from a particular gene as well. So these are heavily regulated, and again, we'll talk a lot more about these after the midterm. Another important aspect about this is that where transcription starts can be at very different places in the genome, and it can start very much by itself. There's no origin per se. The enzyme which does this transcription process catalyzes almost exactly the same reaction as far as extension of nucleotide chains by hydrolysis of nucleotide triphosphates and additions going again from 5' end, adding at the 3' prime end, etc. Big difference between the RNA polymerases and the DNA polymerases is that RNA polymerases can start without a particular primer. So they can put one nucleotide into your template DNA, template DNA, and non-template DNA, your non-template at the top, template at the bottom. These two strands have to be pulled apart through the activity of a helicase. And once they've been pulled apart, the template strand can be copied through transcription and the way that this happens, the RNA polymerase enzyme itself, which is made up of multiple individual proteins or subunits, this RNA polymerase will translocate along the DNA, making copies of the template as it moves along. Because transcription can take place from multiple different places in the genome, and it's very important where the RNA polymerase starts, because it can start anywhere, probably one of the most important aspects of transcription is where you actually start. Where transcription starts is called the promoter. In bacteria, the promoter is recognized by the RNA polymerase holoenzyme, RNA polymerase plus the sigma factor. When you have RNA polymerase plus a sigma factor, it can move along DNA until it finds a promoter. Finding a promoter, you have now strong binding, multiple weak interactions that are specific now to a promoter sequence together with the sigma factor. Once you have that, we now have a closed complex, closed because the two DNA strands are together, they're bound to each other. Then we have a conformational change of the holoenzyme giving an open complex where the two strands have come apart. In bacteria, this is only dependent on the sigma factor and the RNA polymerase itself. In eukaryotic systems, you of course need the TF2H protein to help this happen. After you have open complex formation, there's a short period of so-called abortive initiation where short transcripts are made, but the RNA polymerase doesn't change its structure and these short transcripts are actually released and the RNA polymerase sits in one particular position on the DNA. After a certain period of time, and again this is regulated in many cases, the RNA polymerase gets past this abortive initiation step and then starts to move into an 
elongating complex. This elongating complex is now a very different structure and is also incredibly processive. In that conformational change, the sigma factor dissociates from the rest of the polymerase and waits until the polymerase gets to the end of its transcript. We'll take a look at the end of the transcript here in just a second. The DNA is released from the polymerase. The RNA is released from the polymerase. Now this polymerase can bind to the sigma factor, forming another holoenzyme, and the whole process can go through again. Importantly, where do you start? These are the promoters. Now, promoters in bacteria have sequences, 10 nucleotides, I should say centered at 10 nucleotides, and 35 nucleotides away from where transcription starts. In this case, transcription would be over here to the right-hand side or downstream from where you have promoter binding. These promoter binding sites, 10 nucleotides away and 35 nucleotides away, vary. But if you look at a so-called consensus sequence, it's a consensus sequence, this is the one if you make lots and lots of comparisons of different promoters to each other, which nucleotides you find most frequently at different positions, that consensus sequence here is going to be TATAAT at the minus 10. Don't need to remember those sequences. TGACA at the minus 35. But not all promoters are like this. But if you have a promoter which is most similar to these sequences, now the holoenzyme will bind to this very well. And if it binds very well to the sequence, you're also going to get a lot of transcription because that's where the polymerase is bound, will form closed complexes, open complexes, and start to transcribe. If you have a promoter where you have multiple changes relative to this sequence, i.e. it's far away from the consensus, then the holoenzyme will not bind as well to this position, and you won't get as much transcription from that particular promoter. I mentioned upstream and downstream here because RNA polymerases only copy from one strand. Unlike the semi-discontinuous replication that we have, these RNA polymerases will just copy from one particular template strand. So if you have transcription starting at this position right here, on your template strand, if the promoter is here to the left, you will transcribe in this direction, your minus 10 and your minus 35 here relative to the transcription start site. If on the other hand, the minus 10 minus 35 sequences are off to the right here, then you'll be transcribing on the opposite strand. Now the bottom strand is serving as your template as opposed to on the left-hand side, panel A, or the top strand is serving as your template. And if you look at a particular piece of DNA, here a segment of the E. coli chromosome at the bottom of this slide, you can see that often we'll have one strand which is being used as a template, a different strand which is being used as a template, and even more often you'll have the what we call divergent transcription, a particular reason, region, excuse me, where you'll have some transcripts being made from one strand template and other transcripts being made from the other strands template. Now we've started transcription. You get to the end of the gene which you are transcribing. How does transcriptional termination take place? There seems to have been some confusion about this in the lecture, so I wanted to go over it again. Here there are now specific sequences that are present in the RNA which can form secondary structures. So the transcript, here's your RNA polymerase coming along. The RNA polymerase is gone in this picture. We'll transcribe certain sequences in the RNA, which can form stem loop structures, followed by transcribing a whole set of U sequences, U being uracil. Uracil binds to adenine with only two hydrogen bonds. This is a relatively weak interaction. And what appears to happen is this hairpin loop structure, secondary structure, which forms in the RNA, together with a stretch of U's, relatively weakly base paired to your template DNA, will cause this RNA to pop out of the RNA polymerase. Once that happens, the two strands of DNA will come back together. The RNA polymerase falls off, tries to find a new sigma factor in order to make a new holoenzyme to continue again.
and this speed bump and oil is basically supposed to say the serpent structure is like a speed bump and the oil is the greasy bits because you have UA base pairs as opposed to GC base pairs. So speed bump, secondary structure, oil here, if that helps you remember this process. So that's the process for bacteria. Now I'd like to switch and talk about the process that we have in eukaryotic cells. Here, finding the promoter is very different. There's no sigma factor in eukaryotic cells, but instead there are a whole number of what are called general transcription factors, or GTFs. A eukaryotic promoter has a Tata box, as we'll see in just a second, also a TF2B recognition element, which is right next to it, again upstream relative to the start of transcription. The Tata box is bound to the Tata binding protein. The Tata binding protein is present as part of a much larger complex, also known as TF2D. TF2 represents the fact that these are transcription factors that work with RNA polymerase 2. RNA polymerase 2 is the RNA polymerase which is going to transcribe messenger RNAs that are found in eukaryotic cells. So TF2D through its subunit TBP will bind to DNA. In some cases you have TFA. In all cases you have TF2B which will bind to the TF2B recognition element. TF2E and TF2H are important Sorry, TF2E and TF2F are important for getting your RNA polymerase to associate, and then TF2H, which is the last of the general transcription factors to associate with the DNA at the promoter. TF2H is very important because it serves as a helicase, remember as I mentioned before, for the bacterial polymerase. The bacterial polymerase can separate the two strands in order to start transcription. TF2H helicase is doing that job for eukaryotic transcription. TF2H, in addition, has kinase activity. TF2H is also a very large multi-subunit protein, whereby it phosphorylates the C-terminal domain of the largest subunit of the RNA polymerase, also known as the CTD. The TBP part of TF2D, which is shown here as a cartoon of dimeric protein here in blue, and in green. This protein binds to DNA and bends it, and bends it very sharply. This seems to be very important for assembling the rest of the proteins which are necessary to bind, including TF2B, the RNA polymerase, TF2H, etc. Those proteins are shown down here at the bottom, of what's called the pre-initiation complex. Unfortunately, the X got lost off of the screen here. This pre-initiation complex contains all the general transcription factors, TF2D, TF2B, TF2H, the RNA polymerase, but also multiple other proteins as well, including the so-called mediator complex, which does not bind to DNA, but interacts with enhancer binding proteins, which we'll talk a lot about after the midterm. Also, chromatin remodeling complexes, which you talked about at the last midterm. Histone acetylases, also important that we talked about before the last midterm. All of these things together seem to be required in order to get transcription at a eukaryotic promoter. Many, many, many different proteins that are involved in this whole process. This is one of the reasons that myself and Dr. Bartlett are very interested in looking at transcriptional initiation in archaea as opposed to transcriptional initiation in eukaryotic cells because it's a lot simpler system. In archaea, you only have one RNA polymerase instead of the three RNA polymerases that you have in eukaryotic cells. You only have the Tata binding protein. You don't have all of the rest of the subunits that you see in TF2D. And there's also a TFB protein, which is the analog of the TF2B protein that you find in archaeal polymerases. So understanding how TBP and TFB associate with the archaeal RNA polymerase tells us something about archaeal transcription, 
but also tells us something about the very basics of a eukaryotic transcription in the absence of having all of these extra subunits being involved there. So now we've made our RNAs. If we're bacteria, this is fine because that RNA actually gets translated directly. However, in eukaryotes, this RNA gets heavily modified before it actually ends up being translated. So now I want to spend a couple of minutes reviewing what we talked about as far as messenger RNA processing is concerned. The first thing that happens as you have transcription taking place, after about 25 nucleotides have been transcribed, at which point the RNA has now come out of the RNA polymerase complex, now you have capping enzymes which take over and form this cap structure. Cap structure binds to the cap binding complex, protects the end of your messenger RNA, and also helps with translation, as we'll talk about right towards the end of today's lecture. This cap is very interesting in that there's a inverted guanosine residue which binds to the first nucleotide of your transcribed RNA, first nucleotide of the messenger RNA, this very interesting 5 prime 5 prime phosphodiester bond with three phosphates in it. And it's this 5 prime 5 prime end, which now there's no 5 prime end for an exonuclease to bind to. And this guanosine is also methylated, and that methylation gives a structure to which the cap binding complex can actually bind. In some cases, you have methylation of the riboses at the first two positions here, but that's not true in all of the cap structures. How does this happen? Primary transcript, you have a triphosphate at the end of your messenger RNA. Phosphatase cuts off that first phosphate. Then the guanylyl transferase will bind to GTP, which loses two phosphates, pyrophosphate. This GTP, this one over here, is bound through a single phosphate to the two phosphates, which are on the end here. The guanosine is now methylated. This is a functional cap structure. This would be cap zero. If you have methyl groups added to the first position or second position, that will give you cap one, one methyl group, cap two, two methyl groups. So now we have our caps. What do we do with the next step as you're transcribing? Splicing takes place. <clears throat> the mm, whole process, which is including your messenger RNA, all of the snRNAs, and the proteins that are associated with them, this is the spliceosome. So messenger RNA plus proteins plus ribosomal RNAs. All of these things together are the spliceosome. Number of people have asked me about what the difference is between an SNRNP and an SNRNA. The SNRNAs are parts of the SNRNPs. So if I talk about U1, U2, U4, U5, U6, these are the SNRNA, U1 SNRNA plus proteins would be an SN ribonucleoprotein. Here's a nice example of one of those. I believe this is U1. I'm not actually certain. The RNA is in green. The proteins associated with it are in gray. So this would be, assuming the RNA is U1, this would be the U1 SNRNP with an U1 SNRNA and proteins that are associated with it. So how does splicing take place? You have an exon here in blue, intron in yellow, as this messenger RNA is being transcribed, first thing you have is association of the branch binding protein. This is now not an RNP. U2 activating factor, which will bind to the position in the RNA where the splice lariat, which is the intermediate, is actually going to form. Once you have these associations, then you have association of the U1 and U2 SNRNPs. 
These SNRNPs, again, contain the RNA, the U1 SNRNA and the U2 SNRNA. These now are going to bind to the consensus sequences present at the 5' prime end of the intron and the 3' prime end of the intron, as well as where this branch point is going to be forming. After you have the binding of U1 and U2, then you have U4, U5, U6, which will bind. These are really the active parts of the spliceosome, particularly U6. The activity of U6 is blocked by the presence of U4. That's then removed by RNA helicases. Once U4 has been removed, U6 can catalyze first the formation of a 5 prime, 2 prime phosphodiester bond that forms to the branch point, and then the following 5 prime to 3 prime phosphodiester bond, which forms between each of these two exons, giving you a final splice product. How does the cell know, again to overanthropomorphize here, which exons to use and which exons not to use? Generally, most exons in any given gene will be used because they will bind to U1, U2, and splicing will take place. Some exons, however, are used only in some of the messenger RNAs, and this usually varies from different cell type to different cell type, sometimes even time-wise in terms of development. So if you have an alternative exon, if you want that alternative exon to be used, you need to bind to an RS or SR protein. On the other side, if you don't want an exon to be used, you don't want this SR protein to interact, and that RG protein will bind and this is all dependent on the presence of one of these proteins or the other protein in a particular cell type where that exon is going to be used. This particular site in the exon that's bound to an SR or RS protein, these are used interchangeably, is going to be a exon enhancer where the RG binds is an exon silencer. The presence of these SR or RS proteins stimulates the binding of U2AF and U2, as well as the binding of U1. And as we just looked at from the mechanism of splicing, it's the binding of U1 and U2 to the appropriate ends of the intron, which leads to splicing taking place in these particular introns. So now we've capped, we've spliced. Now we need to think about what's happening at the three prime end of your messenger RNA. The three prime end of the messenger RNA has a specific sequence in it, which is bound by the cleavage and polyadenylation specificity factor, CPSF. That then recruits by protein-protein binding the cleavage stimulation factor, causes the endonucleolytic activity, which cuts the messenger RNA. Once that messenger RNA has been cut, also through protein-protein interactions, you get the poly A polymerase, which associates with this end. That end is extended by the poly A polymerase. You have poly A binding proteins. This 5' prime end, which is left after the cleavage that takes place to the endonuclease, that's now degraded by an exonuclease, and that's what seems to lead to transcriptional termination by eukaryotic RNA polymerases. So here it's exonucleases as opposed to the secondary structure and U residues, which is what you see in bacterial transcriptional termination. Quick aside to talk about ribosomal RNA. Ribosomal RNA is the most abundant RNA that's present in cells, both in bacteria and in eukaryotic systems. We haven't talked about how it's made in bacteria yet, but in eukaryotic systems, ribosomal RNA is made by RNA polymerase 1. RNA polymerase 1 is specific to the ribosomal RNAs, and you can actually see that up here. These ribosomal RNAs are made mostly as one large, and large you can tell because it's got this 45S Svedberg size here, and then that RNA gets cut into smaller pieces, including by the activity of the U3 small nuclear RNA that's 
not part of the spliceosomal complex. And then multiple covalent modifications that happen to the bases and riboses of the ribosome RNA, which seem to be important for the function of the ribosome. These are now added through the activity of snow RNAs, small nucleolar RNAs. These small nucleolar RNAs, again, through base pairing interactions, just like you see with the small nuclear RNAs, together with proteins that lead to modifications. And the two major modifications here are 2 prime omethyl groups, which get added to the 2 prime position of the ribose, and pseudouridylation, whereby uridine is changed to pseudouridine, again, through the activity of proteins associated with these snow RNAs. So at each of the positions where you have one of these modifications, you'll have a snow RNA, which is base paired to the RNA in order to get the specificity of where you're going to have this chemical modification that takes place. So we have our modified RNAs, which are going to make the ribosome. We have a capped, spliced, and tailed messenger RNA. Now how do we go from RNA to protein? The nucleic acid language to the protein language. Four nucleotides to 20 amino acids. Well, the way this works through the genetic code, again, figured out by Marshall Nirenberg, Gobind Karana, and co-workers, eventually figured out exactly which nucleotides corresponded to what amino acids. Now you can draw them all together in this nice table and look at the first nucleotide here with the red box would be an A, second nucleotide in the yellow box would be a U, third nucleotide in the green box is a G, A, U, G, which of course codes for methionine, which is one of the two amino acids which are coded for by one and only one codon. We also have three stop codons and some amino acids which are coded for by six different codons. And again, codon is just the three nucleotides together, which are then translated into one particular amino acid, again through the activity of tRNAs. Reading frames always seems to be a little bit of an issue, so I wanted to cover this again. We now have for any given RNA, there are three reading frames and any particular reading frame is going to start at either nucleotide 1 in reading frame 1, nucleotide 2 in reading frame 2, nucleotide 3 in reading frame 3. So reading frame 1 at the top, reading frame 2 in the middle, reading frame 3 at the bottom. And because of this particular sequence, and again you can read the genetic code from this, AUG again stands for methionine, if you're now in the second reading frame, this has a UGA at this position. So this is a stop codon. That's not going to be something which is going to be translated. Um, and we'll talk just a second about transcriptional, translational initiation always happens at AUGs. The bottom here, reading frame three, could be part of a protein if there were a start codon off here to the left and a stop codon over here to the right. The only one here which is a particular open reading frame is the one at the top because you have a start codon and a stop codon all in the same frame. So just three nucleotides every time. Frame one, frame two, frame three, starting at nucleotide one, nucleotide two, and nucleotide three. One of the surprises when people figured out the genetic code was that there weren't 61 tRNA genes for each of the individual codons that you find when you look at the genetic code, ignoring, or say, not using the three stop codons, which don't have tRNAs that are associated with them. So it turns out that there are between 30 and 50 tRNAs that you find in most organisms, and there are some that have fewer. So how can you have fewer tRNAs than codons that they have to interact with through base pairing interactions. One of the ways that that can happen is through so-called wobbles. And all that wobble is, which is a term that Francis Crick came up with, is that the first position in your anticodon, in your tRNA, 
doesn't have to form normal base pair interactions with the third position in the codon. So for instance, uracil can base pair with adenine at the third position in the codon, but it can also pair with guanine. And guanine can pair with uracil as well as with its normal cytosine. And then if you have modified bases, which are present in almost 10% of the nucleotides in any given tRNA, those, particularly inosine, can base pair with even more, in the case of inosine, three different bases that it can interact with. And so in this way, you can have the same tRNA, in this case, leucine, GAG, which can interact with two different codons. In the case of isoleucine, IAU, that can interact with three different codons. So now you just have one tRNA that can interact with multiple different codons. How do these tRNAs know what amino acid they have to be associated with? That's the job of the aminoacyl tRNA synthetases. Aminoacyl tRNA synthetases shown here in gray interact with tRNAs shown here in purple, both at the anticodon loop, but also at the three prime end of the tRNA, which is where the amino acid gets attached to. This amino acid is attached through the aminoacyl tRNA synthetase that also activates the amino acid, makes a high energy bond here, can do that while recognizing the anticodon loop, but also being very careful to make sure that the correct amino acid is added. And if the incorrect amino acid is added, the aminoacyl tRNA synthetase will actually cut off the and when I say cut off, hydrolyze the incorrectly incorporated amino acid there. So now we have charged tRNAs. These charged tRNAs again have amino acids that have been associated with them. These now charged tRNAs need to get to the messenger RNA in order to get translation, and particularly the first tRNA, the initiator tRNA, needs to associate with the start codon in the open reading frame, which is going to eventually make the protein. That then has to happen with the small subunit of the ribosome. So the first step that happens in translation, the small subunit of the ribosome comes together with the initiator tRNA at the start codon, again here in green. Only after you have the small subunit of the ribosome, the initiator tRNA associated with the start codon, then and only then do you have the large subunit of the ribosome, which will associate with the messenger RNA. Once you have this association, now translation can take place. Hopefully we all remember there are three RNA binding sites in the ribosome, the E or exit site, the transpeptidation site, the P site, and the A site, the aminoacyl site. An aminoacyl tRNA will come and bind to the ribosome, the peptide will be transferred. This will continue until the ribosome gets to a stop codon. And at the stop codon, the ribosome will be dissociated, the protein is released, and the whole process goes again. In bacteria, how do you get the small subunit of the ribosome to the start codon? This is a very specific base pairing interaction that happens between the small subunit RNA that's part of the ribosome and the messenger RNA, which contains a specific sequence, now the ribosome binding sequence, which is complementary to the sequence in your small subunit RNA, close to the AUG start codon. So here you have the small subunit of the ribosome associates with the RNA, and then you have the initiator tRNA that associates. As we'll see it's different in the case of eukaryotes. In eukaryotes, you have the small subunit of the ribosome that's associated with the initiator tRNA before it's associated with the messenger RNA. This complex is associated with the messenger RNA when it's bound to the eukaryotic initiation factors 4E and 4G that form loop structures. And this happens at the very five prime end. This is not where translation is actually going to start. The small subunit of the ribosome has to move along to the AUG, and once it associates with 
the AUG, and you have the initiator tRNA, which is there. GTP hydrolysis takes place. The initiator tRNA is available. Now you have the large subunit that associates, and translation can take place. This is that process right here. Again, you have translocation of the ribosome along the messenger RNA, starting at the 5' end. This requires ATP, probably because of secondary structures which are present in the messenger RNA between the 5' end and the start codon. Once this happens, again, GTP hydrolysis happens. This eukaryotic initiation factor 2, which is homologous to the bacterial initiation factor 2, again, also a GTPase. This is now removed because of the conformational change that happens on GTP hydrolysis. Now the large subunit of the ribosome can bind. Here the large subunit of the ribosome binds. Now we have our initiator tRNA at the P site, the A site, which is available, and the E site, which is where that tRNA is going to go to. This works by itself. You do not need any additional factors, but additional factors will <clears throat> help this process considerably. The first of those factors is going to be EFTU in bacteria, eukaryotic elongation factor 1 in eukaryotes. This helps the binding of amino acyl tRNAs, make sure that's the correct binding of amino acyl tRNAs, and if there is correct binding, the small subunit of the ribosome will help GTP hydrolysis, releasing this amino acyl tRNA so that you can get transpeptidation to take place. And again, this is usually extended. Um, once you have this transpeptidation that takes place, now you need a second elongation factor, EFG in bacteria, or eukaryotic elongation factor 2 in eukaryotic cells, which will help the ribosome translate, Kate, one more position, and you can undergo this whole process again. Once the ribosome gets to a stop codon, there's no tRNA that can bind to this, unless we have selenocysteine, but that requires other sequences. In general, we only have, we don't have a tRNA that will bind to one of these stop codons. The release factor binds to this site after release factor binds. Now the ribosome, which is the enzymatic activity for forming these peptide bonds, will now, instead of forming a peptide bond to another amino acid, which is not here, form a peptide bond to water, which now gives you the carboxy terminus of your protein. That protein is released. Then you need the activity of additional release factors to move the ribosome along, including elongation factor G or eukaryotic elongation factor 2, which will push the ribosome along until everything falls apart. The ribosomal subunits, large subunit, small subunit, dissociate. In a eukaryotic RNA, this 3' end is going to be very close to the 5' end, can reassociate there, translocate, etc., start the next round of translation. In a bacterial system, there's usually a second ribosome binding site here for the next of the cistrons in a polycistronic messenger RNA. These associate, and you have continuous translation. That is all that I had for today. Good luck in the exam on Friday. See you then, assuming that PSU is open. Keep an eye again on pdx.edu and on the D2L site. If anything changes, I will let you know. Good luck.